Here's the quote. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not exist. That's a pretty good quote, isn't it? The greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not exist. Now, for those of you who are, uh, who are a fan of cinema, or as we like to say more contemporarily, movies, you will know that as maybe the most classic line from a movie called The Usual Suspects. Don't know that I would recommend the movie. Actually, I probably wouldn't. But in this scene, Kevin Spacey is the actor. And he's talking to a policeman about a, a, a gangster named Kaiser Sose. And nobody even really knows if Kaiser Sose ever exists. And he just pulls this quotation out. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not exist. Now what... Many of you know, because I know that most of you spend your spare time reading 19th century French poetry, is that that was actually a quote by a, a famous French poet named Charles Blaudier. And they just pulled it out. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I mean, you know, I came to church today and you're going to start talking to me about Satan? I mean, seriously, is this, is this the way it's going to be? But if you read the theological writings of church history... What you find is that, let's say in the Reformation at other times, there was a lot of discussion about Satan. In very contemporary writings, there's almost none. And my guess is that the, the sweet spot is in the middle of the two. I don't believe as Christians that we should spend our whole lives peeking around every corner looking for Satan. Satan is not God's evil alter ego. Satan is not Dr. Evil to God being Austin Powers. It's not that. But Satan is real. And guess what? Sometimes Satan comes to church. And what we're going to study today, we have to look at that together. Satan is very real. He was created by God. Glorious. He fell from a place of grace because he did not want God to get the glory. He wanted the glory. And that began a series of events that became the whole ministry of Satan to pull people away from God. But it's true, Satan goes to church on a Sunday morning. And the reason Satan does that is it's actually one of the most necessary places for him to go. For somebody who's completely away from God, not walking with the Lord, not wanting to grow in their relationship, the most essential relationship, the relationship with the God who created them, he's already got them where he wants them. But if Satan can get into the people of God and can divert their attention by numerous different means, then he wins. Because when you and I and the family of God do not adequately represent Jesus in the world the, our witness is diminished and people do not flock to the Lord. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, once said this, and it's powerful. He said, If Christians really believed and lived the gospel, people would be climbing over each other to get into church to find out what's going on there, and we'd never have to hold a crusade. And this was a guy, and we speak of the crusade, an evangelistic crusade. And this is from one of the most famous evangelists in the history of the church. What we're going to study today as we continue this study in Revelation 2 and 3. So I want you to open up in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to take the fourth letter the, to the church in Thyatira. And the issue in this church is that they are not being careful. And because they are not being careful, an inroad has been made into the church. And it was wreaking havoc on who they are. Now, by way of summary, and for those of you who've been studying this series with us this summer, you know all of this already, that Jesus is using a, a checklist in each church case study. And we've been seeing this each week. Each letter is laid out in primarily the same way. It begins with the revelation. Jesus is saying, look, this is who I am. And Jesus wants to reveal himself to and in his church at all times. So the checklist begins with this revelation. This is who I am. 
Then it moves to the good. This is what you're doing well. This is what I want to commend you on. This is an area that you are excelling in, that you are being faithful in. But then also Jesus gets to the bad because Jesus, when he makes a forensic analysis of any church, any person, he sees the growing edges. He sees, look, this is not an area of strength. This is an area of struggle. This is an area of failure. So Jesus identifies the bad and then he challenges us. And I love that about Jesus because Jesus realizes that our growth in this walk of faith, that if you can identify the growing edges and if you are intentional about doing things to try and change it, that you will grow. So often people realize there's a growing edge, but they don't feel like doing anything about it. So Jesus challenges each church saying, because this of this growing edge, this is how I challenge you. And then for those who take the, ta- the challenge of the Lord, they get to the promise, that promise to the overcomer, to the person who Jesus says, look, this is your growing edge. You have taken my challenge, and this is my promise for you. Because there's a blessing for walking with the Lord. And each one of these letters, of course, remember we've said, each one of these seven letters were literal local churches some 2,000 years ago when the Apostle John received this revelation on the island of Patmos. It was a slow arch, a gentle arch in what is modern-day Turkey. And each church just kind of goes around this arch. But because each letter has the phrase, let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church is, we realize that although each letter is specific for a church, it also has a wider application to the other churches and to all churches throughout time. Now, before we get into this letter, I do want to say that because of the content of this letter and because of what I believe to be a very strong um, compelling by the Lord, um, this message is going to contain some adult content to it. Not graphic, but it is going to be a message that we need to deal with the topic of sexual immorality. And I really feel like the Lord wants us to treat it a little bit more uh, fully than just a Passover. So if you do happen to have young children in here, um, I wanted to let you know that I am going to get into that. And so I want to give you the opportunity to take your kids out into the family room. Of course, we have Crossroads Kids. Um, But it is, I do need to deal with some adult subject matter given the text. And so um, while I read the text, I do want to encourage you to go on out and take take your younger ones out if they're here in the sanctuary. And if you choose to keep them in, then you can debrief with them after service, um, which is a good thing to do with your kids in kids' church anyway. After you pick your kids up in kids' church, the ride home, great debrief time with your kids, especially if it's accompanied by a donut. (laughs) And all the kids in kids' church are like, Pastor Daniel, yeah! (laughs) Donuts! Okay, anyway. So open up in your Bibles, Revelation Chapter 2. If you don't know your way around your Bible, no worries. I'll get you there. There's Bibles underneath your seat. Just turn it over to the end, and then turn back one book. The book of Revelation right there. Chapter 2. That's easy to find. It's after chapter 1. Before chapter 3. And we're going to pick up in the fourth letter. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And if you're brand new to the Bible, no worries, but there's these little numbers next to the verses so you can find exactly where we're going so we can all track along together. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. We're going to pick up. Look what it says. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira... These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet... Are, f- are like fine brass. Verse 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. And eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. 
I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Verse 25, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's interesting that one scholar said the longest and most difficult of the seven letters is addressed to the least known, least important, and least remarkable of the cities. Thyatira was some 45 miles east of Pergamos. So remember we had Ephesus, then Smyrna, then Pergamos, and now we're moving east as we're getting to the top of that arch. Thyatira, it's modern-day Akasar, which is in modern-day Turkey, just about 30,000 people. It's an unremarkable city. What we do know about the city is that it had very strong trade guilds. In, in Acts chapter 16, we run in to a woman there. Her name, of course, was Lydia, and she was a dealer of purple cloth, these very special cloth from the city of Thyatira. And again, like all these letters, it's written to the angel of the church in Thyatira. I've said it each time, I'll keep saying it, that the angel, that word angelos, it could either mean a supernatural angel, like a guardian type of an angel, or an angelos is used in extra biblical literature of just anybody who's a messenger. So it could either to be a, a, a supernatural angel or someone who has caretaking authority over the church in Thyatira, like a bishop or a pastor. So it's addressed to the angel, but it's for the entire church. Now look at the revelation. The way Jesus reveals himself to the church in Thyatira in the middle of verse 18. These things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So it begins here teaching us that the Son of God has a refining gaze. The Son of God has a refining gaze. And I'm going to explain that to you from this revelation. But it's important to note from the outset, Jesus says, these things say the Son of God. This is the only time in the book of Revelation that the phrase Son of God pops up. So what Jesus does in talking to this church is he pulls out the deity or the divinity card. He's saying, look, I am the Son of God and I am speaking to my church. And I gotta be honest with you. The reason we're all here together is because Jesus is the Son of God. I was talking to a friend of mine recently and he was asking me, he's like, you know, Pastor Daniel, so, you know, how do you do this? Like, when you go away, do you not announce to the church that you're gonna be gone? Because pastors worry about that. You know, they worry about like, if the pastor's not there, does no one come to church? And I was telling him, like, I don't worry about that at all at Crossroads because the reason everyone comes to Crossroads is because Jesus is in our midst. And it doesn't matter who the pastor is. It doesn't matter who's teaching the word. It doesn't matter who's leading the band. The reason we get together is because each time we get together, the presence of God shows up. Amen? That's one of the greatest testimonies that we have as a church. All the time people are like, man, I heard the presence of God is so powerful at Crossroads. I'm like, yeah, man, God shows up every single time we get together. And you know what? That's what makes church church. No pastor makes church church. Jesus makes church church. And the presence of God is all that matters. There could be a talking donkey up here, and sometimes there is. But if Jesus shows up, it's all good. 
It's all good. Like even on Wednesday, for those of you who are part of our Rockin' Wednesday night crew, we had a night of, of, of prayer and worship on Wednesday night. And there was like 500 people here. Why? Because Jesus is worthy to waste an evening on. He's worthy of that. And that's one of the things that makes me so excited about what God is doing in our midst. It doesn't matter who's up here. Pastor Bill was, was our lead pastor for 37 years, and now I'm the lead pastor, and Lord willing, I'll have a good long run. And guess what? After me, someone else is going to be here teaching God's Word, and it doesn't matter who it is. All that matters is that we open up our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ because He is God. He is the Son of God. Amen. And each time you show up for worship, whether it's on a Sunday or a Wednesday or in a small group, when you show up for worship, you should show up expecting to meet with the true and living God. I hope you're here today saying, Lord, I know you want to speak to me from your word. I know you want to talk to me. Each one of these letters says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And Lord, I want you to speak to me. I want you to meet me in your word today. I want you to meet me as we worship you today. And guess what? The healthiest church is a church who's focused on Jesus and not some talking head at the front of the room. And I'm grateful that we're that kind of church. It doesn't matter who's teaching, who's leading worship, because Jesus shows up each and every time. And to me, that is mark number one of a healthy church. So I commend you guys for that. They don't say, oh, well, Pastor Daniel's not there or Pastor Bill's not there, so we're taking the week off. You say, listen, man, Jesus is gonna show up no matter what knucklehead's standing up there. It's a good thing. But Jesus pulls out the deity card. And he doesn't do that very often where he's like, listen, this is God speaking to you. But that's what he does with the church in Thyatira. He says, these things say the son of God. And then he goes on to look at what it says. He says, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Now, this is a quotation from Revelation chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. These, he's the son of God. He has eyes like a flame of fire and he has feet like fine or burnished brass. Now, when you think about his eyes like a flame of fire, remember I said that this teaches us that the son of God has a refining gaze. See, fire in the Bible is always a picture of either judgment or growth or purification. The picture, of course, is of the refiner's fire. Now, for those of you who've been around church, you've heard this a number of times, but for the sake of the application, I'm just going to go through it again. Now, when you think of a precious metal, a precious metal does not come out of the ground ready to be a ring, a necklace, an earring, or whatever else. It does not come out that way. It gets made that way by a refiner. And so a refiner realizes that if you heat up a precious metal, at some juncture, at the right temperature, it becomes a liquid. That's why if you have a wedding band on, it didn't come out of the ground that way. It was fashioned that way. So what happens is a refiner realizes that if I heat this precious metal, it'll become a liquid. And then at the very precise, perfect temperature, all of the impurities rise to the top. And a refiner will come with a little skimming tool and take the impurities right off. And once the refiner perfectly refines the precious metal, then they begin to cool it down and fashion it into whatever shape they want it to be. Now, what's fascinating about that is the refiner also realizes that when he's turning the heat up, if he turns the heat up too far, he'll actually ruin the metal. So a refiner realizes the exact heat that is necessary to bring the impurities to the surface. Now, to apply it to our lives, there's some of you in here today, right now, where God's turned the heat up, and you know it. There are circumstances and situations in your life right now that the refiner, the Son of God who loves you and died for you, is now orchestrating and allowing circumstances that all of the impurities of your heart are coming to the surface. So if you're in here today and in the last day or two, you've had that freak out moment, welcome to the refiner's fire. Because in, when the heat gets raised, then all the impurities come out. What's interesting is without the heat being raised, the impurities just stay below the surface. There's still impurities. But it's the heat that brings the impurities to the surface. Now I want to encourage you, if you're that person, if God's turned the heat up in your kitchen— and all the garbage is coming out, he is 
a loving refiner. He's not looking to destroy you. He's looking to make you better. And so be encouraged to know that he will not raise that temperature too far. Just enough. Just enough. Because what happens when those impurities come to the surface? You become aware of them. You say, oh God, help me. Take this from me. Take this anger. Take this judgment. Take this bitterness. Lord, take all this trash out of my life. And the Lord's like, man, I love taking out the trash in my kids. He loves it. God loves you enough not to leave you the way that you are. Do you realize that? That God loves you too much to keep you where you are. He sees you in all of your potentiality. And he sees the way that you are right now. And he's saying, oh, there's so much more in you. So much greater things in you. And so the Son of God, with that eyes of fire who sees us and allows the heat to be turned up, that all the impurities can rise up so that he can say, look, I'm gonna gonna clean you up. I'm gonna change you. I'm taking all the gunk out of you. I'm doing a dump run with your garbage. That's what this means. It's interesting that in Daniel chapter 10, verse six, Daniel sees a very similar vision to what John sees. It says, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire. His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. And the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Again, feet like fine brass. It speaks of refinement and purity. This is who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He wants to talk to the church in Thyatira as God's Son, saying, look, I want to refine you. I see everything. I know exactly what's going on. Do you realize that, that God sees everything? I know we know it, but do we know it? I, I, I know when you're thinking it's like God sees everything. That means not only does he see you when you show up on Sunday or Wednesday with your church best on, but he sees you in those really gnarly moments. He sees you when you say the things that you shouldn't say, when you think the things that you want to say. He sees you in all of the worst places. But you know what? That's what's amazing about the Lord. If anybody else were to see us in that spot, we probably wouldn't like somebody very much. But God sees you with all of the failings and he still loves us. Because God is love. That's who he is. That's who he is. And he wants, he knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in your life, my life, everybody. You know, I loved it. I heard a little child asked a, a Sunday school teacher, said, you know, so, so God knows everything about me. I mean, wh- why? Why does God always watch me? And the Sunday school teacher in a moment, just kind of obviously inspired, just said, well, God loves you so much, he can't take his eyes off you. And, and it, it's, it's a little plaque, but it's beautiful and true. God loves you that much. He loves you so much that every move he's checking out, he's like, Wow. Sometimes he's like, whoa. Whoa. But he's the son of God. And he's got his eyes on us. Now, in verse 19, we move into the good. Look at what it says. It says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works... The last are more than the first. So he gives them a five-fold commendation. Notice, I know your works, the general manner of life. I know your love, both for me and for others. I know your service. God wants us to be servants. Jesus said the greatest in my kingdom is what? The servant of all. God wants us to be servants. We serve him by serving others. I mean, isn't that, that's the way Jesus taught us to live. We live in a day and age where people in power do everything so that people will serve them. And Jesus, the Son of God, comes and says, my way of leading is by serving everybody. Saying crazy things like the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus' way up is by downward mobility. Jesus says, I rule by serving everybody. 
how different it is than the prevailing opinions of the day on what leaders and rulers are supposed to be like. And the church in Thyatira, they're doing good. They got good works. They're lovers of God and people. They're servants. Notice their faith. I know your faith. In the midst of all the circumstance of their life, they exercised faith in God. They believed but didn't see. They trusted even though their circumstances dictated something different. They were known for their faith and not only that, their patience or their perseverance. They kept on going. They didn't quit. They didn't throw in the towel. They trusted in the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit through John cycles back. And look what it says. It says, And as for your works... The last are more than the first. And we get this application. Do more than you did yesterday. Brothers, sisters, do more than you did yesterday. It's interesting. There's a contrast. The church in Ephesus, the first letter, their first works were better than their later works. The church in Thyatira, they're doing more and better works now than they had done in the beginning. We need to do more and better work than we did yesterday. And I'll be honest with you. I believe this is a very important word for us today. And this phrase has been something that has driven me and the leadership of Crossroads. Because when I look at the history of Crossroads Community Church, God has used Crossroads in absolutely astounding ways. 37 years of all sorts of phenomenal ministry. And then I read this. Let your last works be more than the first. And I'm so grateful for Pastor Bill and the pastors and leaders and folks who've been a part of Crossroads forever because they set the standard for us really high. I mean, a lot has gone on. And everything that we are seeking the Lord on is about, Lord, yesterday was awesome. We love our past, but Lord, we want our latter works to be greater than our former works. That's why we have folks worshiping in the chapel. Someone said, oh, you know, what's up with the chapel venue? I'm like, well, it's simple. We're doing the chapel menu because we want to meet, reach as many people with the gospel message as possible. And we have people who've joined Crossroads since we did the chapel venue, because the reason they don't come to Crossroads is they didn't like worshiping in a large sanctuary that seats two. They liked a smaller venue. So we opened up the chapel, and there are people who just love it. They worship in there every Sunday, our nine o'clock service. Some people are like, hey, I don't really love the, the worship style in the sanctuary. So we put a similar style, but slightly different, in the chapel. And some people are like, I just love that. I, I, the, I, the Lord ministers to me through the worship. Someone said, oh, why are you segregating people? It's not about segregating people. It's about reaching more people with the gospel. I'm so excited. In September, we have a Latino venue launching. We're during our 1115 service in the chapel. We're going to have a crossroads worship service that's going on entirely in Spanish. And someone said, well, why would you want to do that? Because guess what? The fastest growing demographic in Clark County is the Spanish-speaking demographic. And guess what? If they don't speak English as as a heart language, we can't reach them with the gospel because they can come and listen to me and I sound like... It makes... It's unintelligible. So we're saying, look, we want to reach people who do not speak English. We do not want our language to limit the number of people we can reach. So we're going to start a Spanish venue. And there's, listen, there's some of you in here who you speak Spanish, that's your native tongue, your heart language, and you love what's going on. We don't want you to not be here, but think about the tens of thousands of people who we can reach with the gospel if the guy standing in front is not speaking English, but speaking Spanish. So I'm not saying all the Spanish people are supposed to go over there. No, 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 no. I'm saying, look, if you come here and you love it, you should think about, hey, I want to reach that community because I can speak Spanish. I can actually do it. So I come to one service and I go serve the other community so that we can see thousands of people who speak Spanish here in Clark County hear the gospel. It's not about segregation. It's about integration. It's about reaching as many people. We're praying about doing a Russian-speaking venue at some point. Because there's lots of Russian Americans who are here. They love Crossroads. We're not saying we don't want them to be here. We're saying, look, there's all groups of people who they love their Russian heritage. It's a huge Russian-speaking population or area. 
And if we can reach people who wouldn't normally come to Crossroads in a way that, that reaches them, we're game for it. Our internet venue, our internet we have over 100 people watching every single service online. People in Whitefish, Montana. People in Texas. People in Alaska. And there's some people who are shut and they can't even make it to church. So we're going to move our live stream to an internet campus. So that we can have a pastor who's caring for them. Who's getting their prayer requests. Who's being able to minister. We can even go visit them. I mean, imagine you had a whole group of people up in Montana who's watching Crossroads and one of us takes a flight up there and we go and we do a, a group baptism with 50 people who are watching our video stream. That and then a million other things. Like launching a, a, a location in East Vancouver, in Camas, in Richfield, in downtown, in Rosemere. Who knows? Why? Because our last works need to be greater than our, our first works. Now, I, that's us as a church Right? But I also believe that there's a lot of us in here today that you used to serve the Lord hardcore back in the day, and now you're sitting back in your easy chair. And if that's you, if you, yesterday was awesome. Praise the Lord for how God used you. But today is today. And until Jesus comes back for us to live as Christ and to die as gain, I believe that there's a lot of people in our midst who need to re engage yourself in the work of the ministry. You need to roll up your hands, roll up your sleeves. And sure, maybe it's a little more creaky than it used to be, but just serve the Lord. I, I mean, Pastor Bill's a phenomenal example of this. Pastor Bill's not like letting off the gas. Man, he just, he just got himself a new, a little deuce coupe, and he's rolling. Not really a little deuce coupe. I mean, it's just, but, but he's, he just switched seats. God wants to use him. I think of Caleb in the Bible. Caleb was... One of the only two people who made it into the promised land. If you don't know what I'm talking about, come out on Wednesday. One of two people who left Egypt who made it into the promised land. You know, when he gets there, there's a mountain with all sorts of people living in it, giants, and, and, and Joshua's like, who wants to take that mountain? And everyone's like, mm. all the young guys are like, uh, no, no. And Caleb's like, I'll do it. And I can just imagine all the young guys being like, oh, yeah, look at that old geezer, you know, he thinks he's going to do it. And sure enough, know Caleb did? He rolled heads up that mountain. That mountain was where his people lived. And I believe we need that. We need people, old and young. If yesterday or a year ago or five years ago or 20 years ago, you were really involved in ministry and now you're just kind of chilling out, that needs to stop. Your last works need to be better than your first works. Praise God for yesterday. We love the past, but today is now. Today's now. And we need to re-engage in the work of ministry. I love this about the church in Thyatira. Do more than you did yesterday. Whatever yesterday was, take it to the next level. If yesterday you did 15 push-ups, today do 18. Take that next step with Jesus. I believe God wants to use us in a more profound way than we ever fathomed if we are willing to say, look, I don't got a lot going for me, but what I got, I'm here to serve. Lord, what do you want to do? And do more than you did yesterday. Don't let, don't, let's never fall in. And I love Bruce Springsteen. I'm just going to be honest. He's the boss. He built my state, New Jersey. You guys know, Bruce, never mind. We're in Washington. Bruce Springsteen. You know the glory days? You guys all know the, the intro guitar riff. One of the most famous guitarists. Dun, 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 dun. You know, and so many of us, you, you got, Google it. I mean, like, what kind of a church is this? You don't know St. Bruce Springsteen? No. <laughs> but listen, your Christian life should not be the glory days. Every, today's the glory days. No looking back. No being like, that's when it was really going on, and now I'm just kind of, no, no. That's called being backslidden. We need to pump it up, man. You know what? We're in fifth gear. Ours goes to six. For those of you who know Spinal Tap, my amp goes to 11. You know what I'm talking about? Never mind. I, I'm sorry for my obscure references today. I got, I got to pray for you guys. I don't know who Bruce Springsteen is. I think, I'm, you know what? Let me pray right now. <laughs> 
We need to do more than we did yesterday. No glory days, no looking back on some yesteryear when things were really going on with Jesus. That needs to be today, right now. Because anything else is missing out on what God is up to. God doesn't put you on the shelf and retire you as you get older. Or when he uses you great for one year, when you were young, then say, okay, that's it, you're done, now just skate. No, 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 no. God wants to use you right now. Right now. Now, as we move to verse 20, we get into the bad. We get into the bad. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to unpack it. Look what it says. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who search the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, I'm going to give you the principle, and then I'm going to unpack it. And the pr principle is this. We need to forsake Jezebel, and we need to follow Jesus. Forsake Jezebel and follow Jesus. And, you know, for those of you who like um, sermonizing, this is alliterative. And it's like a, that's like a, the pastor giving you a, a, an ice cream sandwich. Forsake Jezebel, follow Jesus. The F's and the J's, it's very... Nice for you. Now think, of, think about this. Jesus has against them that they allow that woman, Jezebel, who says she's a prophetess, to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and offer sacrifices to idols. Now, the early church, and really in all generations of the church, the role of the prophet is important. Most people, when they think about prophets, they think, oh, they foretell future events. Actually, if you actually study prophecy in the Bible, only about one-third of the teachings of the prophets have anything to do with the foretelling of future events. It's not the bulk of what they do. The bulk of what a prophet would do is to call into question the status quo of a society and then to give a vision or energize a more glorious future. So a prophet's role is to jar people out of the status quo and complacency and say, look, there's a better way to live. Okay? So the church has always had people who speak prophetically from the Lord as a guider for the people of God. But if you read your Bible, what you find is that there are almost more false prophets in the Bible than there are actual prophets. Just because someone comes and says, thus saith the Lord, does not mean that thus the Lord saith. Okay? Just because someone speaks prophetically does not necessarily mean that that is a prophet. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14, you find that all prophecy should be weighed by the other prophets to see of what sort it is. But one of the ways the church in Thyatira wasn't careful was they allowed this woman, Jezebel, who says she's a prophetess, to get into the church and start to change what was going on. They allowed false prophecy to be a part of what they did, and it had disastrous effects. So listen, I want to tell you this. As a church, we love the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in them. We believe that the Holy Spirit is living and active today as He's ever been. But just because someone comes to you and says, I believe I have a word from the Lord, you need to weigh it against Scripture, but don't trust it on the level of Scripture. You'll know if it's the Lord if it comes to pass. I don't know in my 15 years walking with the Lord how many prophetic words I've been given, and there's been a lot of them, and some of them are so absurd it almost hurts to recount them. Just because someone says, God's telling me this for you. Like, I love it when guys say, God's telling me you're going to be my wife. And women are like, oh, well, the Lord said I don't really like him at all. So you ladies, listen, if a guy says it to you, say, well, I believe if it's the Lord, he'll tell me too. Go away. 
I'll call you if I need you. (laughs) And that's pastoral advice from Pastor Daniel. Just because someone says they're a prophet doesn't mean that they are. God will confirm the prophetic word through his word and through other people. The church in Thyatira let this woman Jezebel run this. And look at what she did. It says that this woman Jezebel seduced and teached his servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, calling a woman a Jezebel would be like calling a man a Judas or a Hitler. Jezebel was one of the most wicked people in the Bible. You can read about her in 1 Kings chapter 16 to 21, and you can also read more about her in 2 Kings chapter 9. Now, to give you a, a quick snapshot of what Jezebel was all about. She was the wife of King Ahab, who goes down as one of the most wicked kings in history. She was responsible of killing Naboth for his vineyard and giving it to her husband. She wanted to kill and almost did all of the prophets of the Lord, except for Elijah. She wanted people to worship the god Baal. And ultimately, in fulfillment of prophecy, she was killed and eaten by dogs. Jezebel was wicked. And Jezebel's area of wickedness was the sin of adultery, both sexual and spiritual. Adultery in the Bible always plays out in two categories, sexually and then spiritually. Offering things, sacrifice to idol, that's called spiritual adultery because we are betrothed to God. We are his covenanted ones, his bride. And when we give our hearts to other things, we are committing adultery on the Lord. That's what the entire book of Hosea is about. But also, of course, sexually. Now, notice what happens. I want want to read you this, and then I want to have a birds and the bees talk with you all. Okay, look at what it says. It says, verse 21, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And then he goes on, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches will know that I search the hearts and the minds, and give to all according to their Work Now, as I said, I was away this past week, and so I had all my studying done. I was, I was ready to teach the message, and I just kind of, like I always do, I, I end up getting done a few days early, and I just kind of read the text and pray, but I've already kind of put it all together. And the thing that was the most pronounced on my heart this week was about the reality and the need for us to talk about sexual immorality as a church And the reason we need to talk about as a church, because if you do any research on sexual immorality or sexuality in America, you realize we are in an epidemic type of a mode. Let me give you some statistics. And I'm using the Kinsey Institute, which has compiled all sorts of data. First, do you realize that by age 18, for both men and women, two-thirds of all 18-year-old men or women have already had sexual intercourse? two-thirds, 70%. What that means is that for our young ones, they are having sexual intercourse, sexual immorality, two out of every three of them. Now, you might say, well, yeah, you know, the, the kids are crazy. Do you realize that the highest percentage and fastest growing percentage of sexually transmitted diseases is amongst the baby boomers, the older generation. Do you realize that pornography is the single largest industry on the internet, apart from the internet itself? The internet pornography business makes more than ABC, NBC, and CBS combined in a given year. 60% of 15 and 16-year-old boys say that they have seen internet pornography and see it, view it with some frequency. Do you realize that one in five Americans have a sexually transmitted disease? And you know what's really scary? 
The statistics in the church are not much different. Brothers, sisters, we need to forsake Jezebel. One out of every two of us in here, every other person statistically struggles with sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is any sort of sexual activity outside of marriage. Whether it's self-satisfaction or someone who's not your spouse, someone other than your spouse, that's all sexual immorality. And you have to realize the reason there is such an epidemic against sexual sexuality is because it is given to us by a gift of God to be the physical embodiment of the oneness between Jesus and his church and a man and a woman. It was created for beauty, and now it's been warped by our society. And the statistics tell us that the church is struggling just as much as people outside of the church. Now, if you're in here today, you know what your struggle is, and guess what? God knows what your struggle is. And I'm here to tell you that if you turn to Jesus and repent, that's what that word means. Repent means turning, changing directions. If you do that and you come to Jesus and you ask him for forgiveness, you will be forgiven. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how much porn you've downloaded, you've looked at on the internet. It doesn't matter how many people you've slept with, how many times you've self-gratified. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you come to Jesus today and you say, Lord, I am coming to you afresh today. I realize that your word is putting its finger on my heart's struggle. If you come to Jesus, forgiveness is there for you and strength is there for you. And if you take that reality and you drag it into the light of of, of the safety of the fellowship of the people of God, there will be people who will walk with you. But don't miss how Jesus talks to his church. He says, I gave them time to repent and they did not. And because they did not, I'm going to kill them. There's there's nothing like going to a hospital and talking to someone who's dying of AIDS. A lot of you have never had that experience. I've had that experience. There's nothing like watching the calamity that comes from people choosing to live in rebellion against God. Do you know how many marriages are being totally wrecked by pornography right now? Do you know how many young peoples, the way that they view their own bodies and the opposite sex is completely warped by by internet pornography? Unless you work in in the social services field or in a church, you don't see it the way some of us see it. And listen, we need to change. Now, I want to tell you this. If you're in here today, you need to come clean today. And I'm here to tell you, this church, this is a grace place. It's a place of grace, which means when you drag your sins into the light, there's going to be no one who judges you because we're all in this together. The person who judges, the person who is honest about their sin is equally as sinful. So I want to encourage you. You need to grab your loved ones, your, some of you, your spouses, and you need to come clean. Just drag it into the light. This is a hospital not a firing squad. No one here will judge you or condemn you because the only reason any of us have anything going for us is because we believe that we couldn't do it and Jesus did it for us. That's the gospel. But the sin is not dragging the sin into the light. Not saying, look, I'm owning my sin. That's what confession means. Confession means to agree with. Confession is saying, God, I agree with you that I am off the rails in this area of my life. Will you help me? I can't impress on you enough how urgent this is. And the reason it's so urgent is because every day, every day we let sexual immorality persist in our lives. We blow our witness. Our love of the things of the flesh might facilitate people going into a lost eternity. It's been said that there are five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then our lives. You know what's interesting? Most people will never read the first four. They're looking at us. And for so many of us, 
we are off the rails and we need to get right today. When I read this, you guys know I love God's word. And I take God's word seriously. When Jesus starts saying, look, man, I gave her a chance to repent. She wouldn't do it. I gave them a chance to repent. They wouldn't do it. I'm gonna kill her children. I'm like, like that should make us nervous. Gentle, loving Jesus who lived a perfect life and died on a cross for you and me says, I'm gonna kill her children. That's how serious this is. And I, believe me, I wrestled with the Lord this week. I'm like, Lord, I mean, I'm normally like the fun and happy guy and you want me to bring this tough word? And Lord's like, look, if you love, if you love my bride, you have to tell them. We need to get serious about this because it is already an epidemic. It's already. And we're busy believing, maybe not the prophets inside the church, but the prophets of our culture say, oh, what's up with that, that, that narrow-minded? I mean, it's just, it's the sexual revolution. I mean, just do what you want to do. It's no big deal. It doesn't hurt anybody wrong. It hurts everybody. It hurts God, you, and society. And the proof is in the pudding. Look at what's going on around you. Look at it. Go and, and care for AIDS patients. Go care for some 16-year-old girl who got chlamydia. Go see what it looks like. It's eating our society from the inside out, and it's killing the church. But again, I say it again. I say it again. There is grace. We're all sinners. The difference between somebody who's saved and somebody who's not is someone who's saved say, you know what, I'm going to just admit that I'm all jacked up. Or as Pastor Bill said on Wednesday night, that I'm a creep. Yet even at a nursery rhyme, I was totally impressed. Nursery rhymes with Pastor Bill, it's so cool. But we just simply say, Lord, I'm all jacked up and I know you have the answer. And if you come to Jesus today, if you already love the Lord, you need to come back and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I am laying this down at the foot of the cross. We need to forsake Jezebel and we need to follow Jesus. And I'm encouraging you right now, you need to do it today. Today. Right now in your heart, you need to say, Lord, I'm, I'm stepping away from that garbage. If you can't handle your computer, you don't need a computer. It's amazing. You shut the computer off, life is glorious still. You shut down your Facebook account because you can't be on there without flirting with somebody who you shouldn't be. You don't need Facebook. You know, you can actually talk to people. It's a beautiful thing. Face to face. Not facing a book face to face. It's, it's a wild thing. It's called interpersonal communication. It, it, it happens. But bro, we need to take it seriously. Now, that's the bad. Now, of course, Jesus gets into the challenge. Look at 20, verses 24 and 25. It says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. You see, where that's where I got the idea that it was important that we realize that Satan's greatest trick was that he convinced the world he didn't exist. The whole Jezebel thing, it's just Satan inspired. It's the depths of Satan. He's just using Jezebel. Notice what it says. It says, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. Jesus tells him, listen, keep on keeping on. That's what it means. Keep on keeping on. Hold fast until I come. Jesus said, look, I am coming back and you need to just hold on. And I believe that that's a strong word for some of us today. You need to just hold on. Keep on keeping on. Maybe for some of you, all sorts of sexual immorality is in the rearview mirror. You just need to keep on keeping on. Maybe for some of you, you've never struggled at all with sexual immorality. You just need to keep on keeping on. One of the hardest things to do in life is to keep your compass set true north at Jesus and not get diverted side to side. Because there's a million things, right, that all of a sudden you're like, and you guys, you guys have heard this in church before, that if you, if you get one degree off when you're flying a plane, as you go 600 miles, you're way off. Just by one small degree, you end up all the way out of whack. We need to keep on keeping on. We need to be proactive and not reactive, following Jesus and not getting 
wiped off the road in a million different directions. We need to keep on keeping on. Jesus says, look, I'm not going to give you any more. Just keep on. Those of you who are walking strong, keep going. Don't stop. Hold fast what I have until I come. And then verse 25, or verse 26, excuse me, as we close, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now notice, this is the first time we have and to the overcomer, and then you have an addendum, and keeps my works until the end. So the closing promise is this. Be eternally minded by doing the will of God. Be eternally minded by doing the will of God. Now I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up and help me land the plane, so to speak. You notice that? To him who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. See, we need to be eternally mine by doing the will of God, by keeping the works of the Lord. Keeping them. Keep on going. Doing the will of God. Not just saying I believe the will of God, but I actually live it out in my life, day in and day out. Now, why be eternally minded? Notice the two promises to the overcomer. First is power over the nations. Literally here it quotes from Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. That quotation there. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. God has promised his church to be co-reigners with him. When Jesus comes into his kingdom in its fullness, he's going to rule the nations and we get to rule with him. Not some sort of power trip rule, but it means God shares with us in his authority, his lordship, and his sovereignty. We get to be a part of that. And we need to keep eternity in view. I remember a bunch of months ago, Pastor Bill gave a message where he used a phrase that I'll never forget, that sometimes we fail to think consequentially. We need to keep eternity in view. We need to. It's important that we realize who we are, what we are destined for. And then notice the second thing. And I will give him the morning star. Now, there's lots of interpretations for the morning star. Lots of them. But in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus calls himself the bright and morning star. To him who overcomes... At the very least, the morning star is Jesus himself. And for me, this might be the most important moment. Most important moment. The gift of God's grace is the gift of God himself. More than anything else, Jesus wants to give you himself. Not as some sort of absentee landlord God, who's distant, but him who is so close, so intimately involved in your life, in your circumstances. God wants to be as intimately involved in your life as you are. He wants to bless you with himself. That's what he wants to do. But God's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to say, yeah, you got, it's just got to be that way. He wants you to invite him. And he wants to give you the the most essential relationship. I'm learning it every day. I love my wife. I love my kids. But my wife and my kids will never fulfill me. They weren't created to fulfill me. They were created to be my companions in the world. I get to nurture my kids. I get to have my wife as a companion. But she can't fulfill me. She wasn't created to be my fulfillment. My fulfillment comes only from knowing God, from being in relationship with Him. And then I can really appreciate this gal that God has given me, these beautiful kids that God has blessed me with. I can appreciate them because God fulfills me in every way and the overflow of that fulfillment goes to them. 
and the overflow of that fulfillment for them comes to me. So no matter who you are today, what you really want is that gift of the morning star. What you really desire deep down in the core of who you are is not a raise, is not a better job, is not a better spouse or a better significant other. What you really want deep down comes from knowing the true and living God and being in Him and known by Him. The deepest of intimacies. But the only way it happens is for you to say yes. Say, you know what, God? Yes. For some of us in here, in a few seconds, I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus. And I I cannot encourage you more profoundly to make that decision. For others of us, you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, but the sin of Jezebel has got you so deep. You still love God, but you haven't had a relationship with Him in a long time. Because you can't. Because you're so busy involved in other things that God's beauty is tarnished by your mistakes. And nobody wants to spend time with the perfect Son of God when we're living in the pit. And I'm not preaching, I know that well. But for some of us, it's time to come back to the Lord. It's time to say, look, I love the Lord. I am way out, I'm off the rails. I need to get back on the rails, Lord. And again, all you have to do is say yes to Jesus. That's it. Just respond to his love. His love that's reaching into your heart right now. That's saying, you know you need this. You know you want this. You know you've been longing for this. You've been looking everywhere. You can't find it because it's only in me. He's reaching out to you. All you need to do is say, yes, Lord. And reach back to him. Amen. So let's bow our heads and our hearts. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I thank you for the church in Thyatira for their Their works, the latter, were greater than the former. And Lord, I thank you for the admonition from their mistakes. And Lord, we see ourselves right there with them. Struggling with our sexuality and our immorality. And Lord, we want to have eternity in view. And Lord, we want to know you. We want the morning star to rise in our hearts and in our lives. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, there's no doubt many in here today, people watching online, watching in one of our other venues, where it's time. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus right now. You've been looking for, for that fulfillment in everything, and it's leaving you hanging, and you know it. You've tried everything. None of it works. And you feel God just drawing you, just saying, come on, you know this is real. You know it's true. You know that your sins can be forgiven no matter all that you've done wrong. If you come to Jesus right now, all of your sins will be be forgiven. You will be fit for eternity, in eternity, heaven in heaven and heaven on earth. If that's you and you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus today, be born again today, I want you just to... Take a step of faith with me by raising your hand. One of a few that we'll take today. Just raise your hand up. Say, I want to be, I want to be forgiven. God bless you. I see you over here on my right. Keep those hands up. God bless you. I see you right behind them on the on the right. God bless you. There's a few people here in the front of me, in the middle. God bless you. Other people, you're saying, I want to be.